for a few problems from the um, unit one practice test for pre-calc. This, I believe, was question five. Sketch the graph of the polynomial function by determining the x-intercepts, y-intercepts, y-axis or origin symmetry, the behavior around the x-intercepts and the end behavior in general. So first we'll look at the x-intercepts. We determine that by setting f of x equal to zero. So it's going to be zero is equal to x times x minus two squared times x plus one uh, cubed. Set each factor equal to zero and solve. We're looking at x equals zero, x minus two equals zero. Now you could say x minus two squared equals zero, but then you're going to take the square root of both sides anyway. x plus one equals zero, same deal. You could say x plus one cubed equals zero, but then you're going to take the cube root of both sides and this is what you're going to end up with. So possibilities x equals zero, x equals two, x equals negative one. These are all my x-intercepts. Remember, we don't start graphing until we have you know, a good amount of points, otherwise we could uh, have an issue with scale. All right, so the y-intercept, we get that by computing f of zero. All right, so f of zero is the y-intercept. So that's gonna be f of zero equal to zero times zero minus two squared times zero plus one cubed. So that zero in the front just wipes out everything else, but I mean, you could, you could follow the additional steps, but we're gonna get a y-intercept of zero. Now I mentioned in class that if you have an x-intercept of zero, you're gonna have a y-intercept of zero, so you could save yourself the time, but I wanted to make sure I reviewed the, the strategy. Uh, y-axis or origin symmetry, so y-axis or origin symmetry. You can go with the test value approach or you could use a, a general approach. I'll do the test value approach because if it fails after that, then it's, then we can stop. All right? if, it, if the test value approach shows equivalence, then I may want to uh, go to uh, the generalizing approach. All right, so I'm going to find f of, let's say, 1. You know, I, I wanted to choose something that's not a root. Although you could probably draw a conclusion about y-axis uh, symmetry based off of the positioning of the roots. If it's symmetric, then if you had a root of x equals 2, then you should also have a root of x equals negative 2. It's the origin symmetry that can be a little trickier. All right, so I'm plugging this in, 1 times 1 minus 2 squared times 1 plus 1 cubed. So that's going to give me 1 times negative 1 squared times 2 cubed. That's going to give me a positive 1 times a positive 1. Negative 1 squared is, is positive 1. So those are irrelevant. 2 to the third gives me an 8. So now I'm going to do the same thing with the f negative 1. So negative 1 times negative 1 minus 2 squared times negative 1 plus 1 cubed. This piece right here is going to cause it to zero out. And, oh, you know what? I just realized I, I did the, the, the thing that I suggested that you do. I just didn't realize I was doing it. Uh, 1 and negative 1. And so this negative 1 gives me a zero. Right, so these two are not equivalent, so I would say that there is no origin symmetry. But I'm sorry, y-axis symmetry. But there's no origin symmetry because they would have to be opposites of one another, and that's not the case. Right? So we could do it that way, or a big or here, we can compute f of negative x. Right? So that would be instead of x, times x minus 2 would be negative x times negative x minus 2 squared times negative x plus 1 cubed. All right, we could simplify. So remember, we can factor out of the, the binomial cubed. It's just it's got to be factored out as a power of 2. Of a, sorry, the binomial squared. It could be factored out, but as a power of 2. 
So if I rewrite, I'd look at this as negative x times negative 1 parentheses x plus 2, entire thing squared, and then negative 1 parentheses x minus 1, whole thing cubed. So extended further, we get negative x times negative 1 squared times x plus 2 squared times negative 1 cubed times x minus uh, 1, sorry, cubed. All right, so negative x times 1 times x plus 2 squared times negative 1 times x minus 1 cubed. And this will become x paren x plus 2 squared. Those two negatives will offset each other. This one here and this one there. x minus 1 cubed. All right, and we just do a comparison between that and the original function to see if it's exactly the same or exact opposite. All right, and it's neither of those. So we would say that there is no symmetry. All right, so we've addressed intercept symmetry, behavior around the x-intercepts. Uh, around the x minus 2 factor, we have the power of 2, so that's multiplicity of 2. For the x plus 1 cubed, that's a multiplicity of 3 around x equals negative 1. And then the, the x itself just has the power of 1. So I'll throw in another color there. That's going to be multiplicity of 1. So it's going to behave like a line around x equals 0. It's going to behave like a parabola around x equals 2. It'll behave like a cubic around x equals 3. All right. For the end behavior, I just want to know what this polynomial would expand out to if we distributed it, but I only really care about the first term. So f of x, well, I'd get a power of 3 out of this one. I'm sorry, power of 2 out of this one. Power of 3 out of this one, if I were to expand the whole thing. And a power of 1. That one's a little bit more obvious. So f of x, I'm just going to kind of move this over. would be, well, there's no coefficients there, so it would just be x to the sixth power plus a whole lot of stuff afterwards that I'm not really interested in. All right, so the end behavior is going to be that of an even function or, or power or a leading coefficient that's even. So it could start high, end high, or it could start low, end low, but it's gonna start and end in the same direction, all right? Now, because this is positive, it's gonna be facing up. All right, so something along these lines, you know, that's just a kind of a rough estimate of what a six degree polynomial looks like, one, two, three. Actually, I might've put too much wiggle in there, two, three, four, five. It would actually be it went, went a little wiggle crazy, something more like this. All right, five turning points. You can't have any more than one less than the degree of the uh, the polynomial. Oh, hello, that was weird. Uh, so I'm going to start my graph. Uh, scale wise, I'm not overly concerned. And it looks like we got some pretty decent values. I'll go. Uh, 10 in each direction, I guess. All right, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And again, it's supposed to be a sketch, so. I mean, you can make it gorgeous, you know, by the points, but not overly concerned with that. 
All right, so let's get our x-intercepts in there. We got 0, 2, and negative 3. Negative 3? No, no, multiplicity of 3, so, but it was at negative 1. Uh, so 0, 2, and negative 1. All right, now it's got to behave like a line around here. Could go that way or could go that way. It's got to behave like a parabola around x equals 2. Now, since it has to go upward forever, you know, it's got to start high and end high. We can assume that the parabola it's going to behave like is going to, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure about width, but I know it's going to shoot it off to its natural conclusion. Now, in order for it to grab this point, it must turn around somewhere and shoot right through that origin there. And trim the excess. But this other one, that x equals negative 1, should have a, um, a, you know, a cubic look to it. And also, now that I think about it, because I have it right here, when x is 1, oops, when x is 1, y is 8. So I could actually shoot a little higher with this. So 8 is about right here. So we're probably looking at something like this. Going through the origin. Let me trim this up. Maybe going down a lot. But then coming back up. Oops. It's got to behave like a cubic. So maybe it's something like that. Now as far as turning points are concerned. I have one, two, three. That's, no, actually I'm counting the wrong things. I have one, two, that one happens to also be a turning point. So three, yeah, so it's following the rules. You can't have uh, more than five if it's a six degree polynomial and we don't. So that's pretty good. Uh, this I, I'm not in love with, so I'm gonna clean it up just a little bit more. So something like perhaps, I, again, it, the, the point is not to not for perfection is to get a rough sense of what's going on with the graph all right just don't make it i mean i know when i zoom out it looks really pointy down there the the idea is for it not to be pointy so if you got to tweak that a little bit and go for it just never make it look like it's coming to a point you know so smooth it out if you have to round out those uh, those turning points all right or you can mask it you know so this one was a nice smooth turning point, but maybe I accidentally made it too pointy, so I didn't really darken that point in there. And I have my graph, all right? So again, it doesn't have to be a picture perfect sketch, just it has to have all those important ingredients. Six, sketch the graph by finding X and Y intercepts, any asymptotes and behavior around the, uh, the, the vertical asymptotes, all right? Recommended that you factor everything to get started. So I pulled out a GCF. I mean, you can combine steps, but I'm just going to do it piece at a time. So if I'm looking for my x-intercepts, again, I'm going to set the function equal to 0. So I'm going to take all of this and set it equal to 0. Oh, that's interesting. Get rid of this. I actually accidentally copied the, uh, the image that I put in for the question. I'm going to cross multiply, so I'm going to put the 0 over 1. And I'm going to get 2 paren x minus 3. x plus 3 is equal to 0. Set each of your factors equal to 0 and solve. You get x equals uh, 3 or x equals negative 3. Now for the y-intercept, The, the x-intercept are non-zero values, so I'm going to still look for the y-intercept. For that, again, it's f of 0. 
So I'm going to replace every x in my original function with a 0 and see what happens. I'll go back to the original form. A little bit more convenient to work with. So I got, when, when I clean this up, 18 over 25. So about, oh well, it's 0.72, but you know, it's, in, it's about, if I'm plotting it, in the neighborhood of 0.75. Right, so keep that in mind. Uh, the asymptotes. So looking at the power between the top and the bottom, uh, power of 2 in both cases. So for my horizontal asymptote, I'm going to take that leading term and I'm going to Pull it out and simplify it. So y is going to be equal to 2x squared over x squared, which simplifies down to y equals 2. So that's my horizontal asymptote. Usually easier to come up with the horizontal asymptote than the vertical. For the vertical asymptote, I'm going to take my, there's no common factor, so I'm going to take the denominator instead of the equal to 0. And solve x equals 5 or x equals negative 5. So now I have all my asymptotes. Uh, the behavior around the vertical asymptotes, we can get that with test values. So I'm going to start my sketch. All right, it needs to be able to go out as far as 5 and negative 5, in fact further. So I'm going to label my x-axis to go out to 10. knowing that there's an asymptote at 5. Same deal on the other side, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 to the left. We make the vertical asymptotes dashed lines, so x equals 5, x equals negative 5, no, I was about to write a two there. The y uh, vertical, oh, sorry, horizontal asymptote is at positive two. So we'll get that in there. All right, I have my vertical uh, asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes accounted for. I have a y-intercept that I said was about 0.75. I'll just kind of put that in there. Uh, X and Y intercepts of 3 and negative 3. So I know that it has to go through these two, uh, these three points and also be asymptotic with the X equals negative 5, X equals positive 5. So I'm going to assume it's going to look something like this. For the behavior around vertical asymptotes, I have two vertical asymptotes, which means I have three distinct regions. So what I'm going to do is test a value that's left of negative 5 and test a value that's right of positive 5, just to see where we're going to live. So I'm going to test, uh, I'll say negative 6, test positive 6. Those go right into the function, the original form, because nothing canceled. It's a little bit more convenient, so 2. Uh, let me make the fraction first. So divide up top, get rid of the ANS there. So 2 paren negative 6, close it up, square it, minus 18. Negative 6, so paren negative 6, close it up, square it, minus 25. So I get a positive number that's bigger than 2. So it is in the neighborhood of 4.91. All right, so at 6, this is my 6. It's 1, 2, 3, 4 point, so almost 5. So it's going to put me right about here. And since it has to go through the, this point and be asymptotic with this and this, it's got to look something like this. Ignore the uh, shaky curve. Right. So then I do the same thing with a positive 6. 
and I get the same number. So I'm going to put that at the same place, uh, about 4.91. Again, I have to be asymptotic with this part and this part here. So the only way that would play out would be as if it looks something like this. All right. We don't, uh, we don't make our asymptotes um, solid lines because we want to avoid confusing that with the actual curve. All right. So the curve itself should be made up of, of, of solid uh, curves, for lack of a better term. Uh, but that would be the, uh, the complete solution for number six. A little uh, compound interest. Tommy wishes to invest $1,000 in one of two local banks. Which would, which would give him the most money? Invest in Savings Bank A. So let me make a note here. Bank A. Uh, compounded monthly. So I'm going to use A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the NT power. Uh, bank B. is continuously, so that's the A equals PE to the RT power. All right, so we're investing $1,000. I wanna know how much I'm gonna have at the end of, at the, end of the uh, period of time. So 1,000, one plus 0 0.022, that's what this is in decimal form. Uh, compounded monthly, monthly occurs 12 times a year to the N, oh, or I know N, all right, so that's 12, and then T is 1.5. Now for the other one, A equals still an initial investment of 1,000, E to the point zero one eight five, and we're doing this for two years, so times two. So it's just number crunching at this point. So 1,000, 1 plus 0 0.022 divided by 12 raised to the 12 times 1.5 power. So we're talking about $1,033.52 uh, $1, money so we can go to nearest tenth. I'm sorry, nearest hundredth. Then 1,000 E, so this is the key we want for E, to the point zero one eight five times two. And that's gonna give me about 1037.69, all right. Now, which of the following would earn him the most money? It's pretty cut and dried. Bank B earns the most money. All right, um, but there is a, another way to interpret this now, it, but it would have to be worded in a different way. If the question said, which of the following would be most beneficial, you know, which, which is a, a wiser way for him to invest his money, you kind of look at it like you, you're only tying your, your money up in bank A for a year and a half. If you did that for a full two years, what would you get? You know, so you can investigate that. You'd have 1044.94, all right? Um, so it might be more advantageous to go with bank A if it's a matter of like which, which one is to uh, Tommy's advantage. Because you kind of look at it like after a year and a half in bank A, you're, you're almost at what you would be at after two years with bank B. So at the rate of increase, it looks like bank A would be the way to go. But the question was very straightforward. It said, which of the following would earn him the most money? If, if it's only these two choices, it's bank B, but it, you, know, you can easily see how it, would, uh, it could be tweaked to be you know, a different answer.